So, let's improve on our Brayton cycle. And what sorts of things can we do with the gas stream once we've got our normal four-step um, Brayton cycle? Cool. Oh, sorry, and the things we're going to talk about are regeneration, um, which is capturing some of the exhaust heat back into the incoming stream. So it's a regeneration. We're going to talk about intercooling. Um, so doing a compression in a few stages. We're talking about reheating, which is doing your turbine in a few stages. And then put it all together and show you a cycle, a more advanced cycle than what you guys have, have seen. So that's the intention. Cool, so regenerator. So if you had tracked or you'd done a few examples from the Brayton cycle, I think this is the week for PSSs. Uh, certainly I've, I've done an example in class. You may have noticed that the exhaust temperature for the gas leaving a Brayton cycle is quite high. And so you say, well, what could we do with that uh, temperature? What could we do with that hot gas to help improve thermal efficiency? And a regenerator is one of the things you can do with it. A combined cycle is the other, another thing you can do with it. We'll talk about that at the end. So what does that look like? We take the exhaust from the turbine. So this is back down to ambient pressures now. So the turbine, we can't use it through another turbine because we're at the dead state pressure. We can't get the pressure any lower, but it's still got some temperature in it. And so what can we do? We can run it back through a regenerator and put some of that heat after the compressor. <coughs> Why don't we put it anywhere else? I think there's two other places we could put heat. We could put heat before the compressor, or we could put heat after the combustion chamber. So why have we put the regenerator between the compressor and the combustion chamber? From a first law perspective, you'd get the same if you, if you transfer the same amount of heat, from a first law perspective, if you put the heat in before the compressor, all the maths would work out exactly the same. But what would it do to the compressor? Reduce the mass flowing into it. Yes, it's along the right lines. Yep. I guess I was thinking you'd have the same mass flow the whole time. So I, but. It's the same answer, but I think it would make the compressor bigger, physically larger, to handle the same mass flow. Or the same compressor would have less mass flow. So yes. Yeah, yeah. So if we put the heat in before the compressor, then the air would become hotter and rarefied. Yep. You're saying that because this temperature is more similar to this temperature, whereas this is a colder temperature, that the heat exchange would be more efficient. From a second law analysis perspective, it would be, but you'd actually find, because this temperature is lower here, you could get more heat. You actually get more heat transferred because you're transferring it to a colder fluid. Um, so you get better first law efficiency, but the physical size of the compressor uh, would have to increase. Would be, the, would be the main reason. We find that we can't put a regenerator between those two pipes because state point three is hotter than state point four. After you've finished running through the turbine, your, your fluid will be, or in this case your gas, will be colder than it was at the start of the turbine, so you can't put a regenerator there. So you don't put it before the compressor, you'd have to increase the size of the compressor and get slightly less efficient compression, we regenerate between the compressor and the combustion chamber. This is what the cycle now looks like. So what are we doing? We're compressing from state point one to two. We're adding heat from state point three to four. We're running through a turbine from state point three to, sorry, two to three. Running through a turbine from state point three to four and then That doesn't sound right, sorry. 
Compress, add heat, yes, and then exhausting from state point four to one. My apologies. So now we've added another state point, state point six, and we've said, well, between state point four and state point six, let's remove energy through a heat exchanger instead of just exhausting it. So that's between state point four and state point six. And between state point two and state point five, let's regenerate that heat then between those two. And we find that whatever heat we can take out of the exhaust stream between four and six goes into the incoming stream between state two and five and directly reduces the amount of gas that we have to combust to perform, to get to the same um, temperature at state point three. What's the limit of regeneration? How hot can we get state point five? In theory. Not the com heat coming out of the turbine. Heat coming out of the turbine. Good. Temperature coming out of the turbine. <laughs> From a language perspective. So, right, the highest that five can get on this TS diagram, the hottest that we can get out of the heat exchanger must be whatever temperature state point four is. So you've come out of the um, you've come out of the turbine at state point four, okay? That's the hottest that the fluid can leave the heat exchanger at state point five. And so there's a five dash on the, on the board there indicating the hottest that you can get out of there. In, in actuality, it'll be something lower than that because you need a temperature difference to drive the heat exchanger. And so then we can define an effectiveness for the regenerator being how much heat did you actually regenerate through the regenerator divided by what would be the theoretical maximum heat you could regenerate through the, um, through the regenerator, which becomes, what's that? State point five minus state point two. Um, so that's how much you actually regenerated. And then state point four or state point five dash, the temperature, um, enthalpy only being a function of temperature, um, five dash or four, minus two being the maximum you could have done. And if you take um, CP as a constant value, then you get that just in temperatures. If you're dealing with variable specific heats, you get a slightly different figure, although the more effective, the less that figure would change. So that's regeneration. What does that do to your thermal efficiency? Well, we find that whilst for our, when we didn't have a regenerator, you wanted really high compression ratios. The higher the compression ratio, the more the thermal efficiency. What we find with compression ratio when we've got a regenerator is for high compression ratios, that temperature difference then starts to work against us. And so actually with regeneration, you can see um, these are, you know, they go up as the pressure ratio reduces. So I think that's interesting. Um, you also don't want to add a lot of heat because that makes your temperature ratio higher as well. And so you can see temperature ratios, lines of temperature ratio there, um, saying that a lower line of temperature ratio is better for thermal efficiency. But again, you don't want to be pumping you know, cubic meters and cubic meters of air through your system only to burn a little bit of fuel um, at some point, power output needs to be um, taken into consideration. But just interesting that from a theoretical perspective, um, things look a bit different when you've got a regenerator. Is that okay? Everyone good? Excellent. Cool. Another thing we can do, and this isn't just for the Brayton cycle, but this is compression in general, is rather than compressing the gas all in one big hit. So if this was from state point one and we went up to state point C and this was an isentropic compression process, okay? What's not shown on a PV chart that I think kind of tells you a little bit of the story as well as what, why this is happening is temperature, okay? So as you go from state point one to state point C, the temperature is rising a lot and that's forcing 
the gas to be less dense because it's hotter. Okay? So it's being less dense. And this is the work that you're doing is the work under that curve, the integration of the PV curve. That's the work you're putting into the system. So to achieve the same pressure, but with less work, what you can do is compress the gas some of the way and then cool it, say back to the original temperature. That'll increase the density and then compress the gas the rest of the way. And you find you can achieve the same pressure at a lower temperature by putting in less work. Now, what that does is it sacrifices some of the temperature at the outlet of your compressor. So then you have to add more temperature by burning more gas to get the same amount of um, work out of the turbine. But work is expensive because to produce work, you know, we're talking about thermodynamic cycles of 35% efficiency or so forth. If you can save a kilowatt of work by putting in 1.2 kilowatt of extra heat energy, that's a good trade-off because your heat energy is easy to come by, work is what you want as your output in a power generation perspective. And indeed, if you could soak the compressor isothermally, which is what the Ericsson cycle uses, then you would follow the, work, the path of least work to achieve the same pressure. So in that case, your n value is one. So P, PV to the power of n, n is one, um, for an isothermal process. So that's intercooling. Intercooling is also used in cars, for example. So in a, as a precursor to the auto cycle or the diesel cycle, you compress your gas, then you cool it down, and then you compress it again, and then it lets you charge more gas into the same cylinder. Um, same sort of thing. So intercooling to reduce the work required to compress the gas. The same can happen on the other end. So this is between your turbines. Let me see. Yep, good, good. I've got a picture. Picture's good. So rather than run through a turbine from the hottest point and the high pressure point to the lowest temperature and, uh, and ambient pressure point in one big hit, if you take it through a high pressure turbine and then reheat it back up to a higher temperature, then take it through a, a low pressure turbine, then you find that you can get more work out of the system without increasing the peak temperature. So the Carnot cycle says if we increase the peak temperature, then we'll have a more efficient cycle because it's to do with the ratios of high and low temperatures. Um, we can't get past a certain high temperature because of material limitations. We just can't run the fluid through a turbine um, beyond a certain temperature. And so what we can do is, well, run it through the turbine at that temperature and then reheat it back up and run it through again. This means that our exhaust temperature is also higher because rather than go through the, um, the whole pressure drop all in one go, we've added more heat later on, which makes regeneration an attractive option. And I should have said this point here, after the compression process, if you've used a dual stage compression process with an intercooler, the temperature after the compressor is also lower. So we burn more gas or that also makes regeneration more attractive. So what does that look like? This is a 10 state point problem. So this is like a thermodynamic cycle. So same as we've done, but instead of four state points, it's got 10 state points. <coughs> we've taken ambient air through a compressor <coughs> to some medium pressure that we would have to specify. We then inter intercool it maybe back down to the same temperature as state point one, compress it again to the high pressure, run it through a regenerator, so you're going to have some enthalpy loss between state point nine and ten, that's going to become enthalpy gain between state point four and five. Then add heat Q in the combustion chamber between five and six. Run it through our high pressure or turbine one, our high pressure turbine between state point six and seven to some medium pressure. Reheat the gas. Um, between say 0.7 and 8 and then run it through another turbine. What we find with the Brayton cycle is that the combustion is a lean combustion. So we don't add, in, a, in an auto cycle, generally you're running close to 
generally burning about as much fuel as that air can allow you to burn. It's, you're somewhere around that kind of figure. What we find with the Brayton cycle is you're generally running a very lean burn, and so there's still oxygen in the air after this combustion chamber, and so you can burn that again, so you just have another fuel ignition point and another, um, or fuel injection point and an igniter in the reheater, and burning that takes it back up to temperature for turbine two. So that's um, what that would look like if we had those. On a TS diagram, so what have we got? We've got some regeneration, state point four to five. We've got heat in and um, heat in and then um, turbine, heat in turbine, and down the bottom, compression, heat out, and compression. So that's what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So what does the temperature of gas do to yeah, the mechanical like, compressor? The actual mechanical compressor. I think it's a good question. And I think it's a function of design as well as temperature. So I think you could design a compressor to work at high temperatures. But I think the materials would be more exotic. Maybe things would have to be thicker because, you know, I know metals get softer. At high temperatures, so. Yeah. But I'm reluctant to say that you can't design a compressor to operate at high temperatures, but it would probably be a less expensive compressor, and yes, the wear life might be might be longer running at colder temperatures. Yeah, I agree. The converse might have to be said of the turbines, though. So these turbines are running at a higher temperature <laughs> because rather than going from hot to cold, they're going hot and then hot. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting, interesting question. What, yeah, uh, we just can't do it. We can't do it in one subject in second year, actually go through designing a, a, a bladed turbine or compressor, and I would love to. <laughs> But it's like CFD, it's, it's a complicated exercise in its own right. But it's a good, it's a good thought. Compressors, good. That's not good. So that's what it looks like. Um, now, before I did the lecture, well, while I did the lecture on the Brayton cycle, I introduced the Ericsson cycle. So the Ericsson cycle is a analogy of the Carnot cycle, except it occurs in four different devices spatially dislocated, so it occurs kind of like a Brayton cycle uh, rather than a Carnot, which occurs in a cylinder, like the Otto cycle. So we find the Ericsson cycle has the same efficiency as the Carnot, so it's like an ideal, no entropy generation um, kind of cycle. <clears throat> we find that if we had lots of compressors with subsequent intercoolers, so we had my pen stopped working, that's fine. We had lots of intercoolers between lots of compressors down the bottom so that we basically compressed the gas isothermally. And then at the top, we had lots of little turbines, I mean little as in um, only, a, only a small pressure drop, drop, between lots of reheaters, then we would reduce the pressure isothermally and with a perfect regenerator, we would approximate the Ericsson cycle. So this is trying to get towards that. Obviously there's some fun, you know, there's practical limitations about your turbines and there was an example. So there's a worked example in Central and Bowles, which these figures are taken from, where they got the thermal efficiency for, from a simple Brayton cycle of 40% to this cycle with 10 state points at 70%. So thermal efficiency up to 70% and then they did the calculation with the third turbine and it added another few percent. So they said, well, you know, you'd really have to question what the capital cost is versus what the improvement in efficiency was worth, you know, capital cost, maintenance cost, um, complexity of the layout and so forth. So Central involved, Central's conclusion was that that's probably worth doing and anything more than that, you'd really have to question. 
So that was interesting. Um, I just got a little comment here because this is the this is the kind of question that you get in an exam type scenario. You get you don't get a four state point question. You get a more than four state point question. Um, there's lots of state points. You know, like you know what to do, or you know you will know. You hopefully know. I just I hope you're you're getting towards knowing. Let me just. Reload that because I do like to draw. Meh. <clears throat> Hopefully you're getting towards knowing what to do with a compressor. So if you were given a pressure and temperature at state point one, that seems reasonable. And the medium pressure point of state point two, so it goes from you know atmospheric pressure to five bar, 500 kPa. Hand up. Nah, we'll see how I do. We'll see how I go. Thank you though. Um, <laughs> Because it worked, it like it worked earlier, right? So, you know, if you were given the state point one, and then you're given a pressure at state point two, 500 kPa, one MPa, you know, whatever, and you were told it's isentropic or it had an efficiency of 92%, then I feel like, for example, because you can take isentropic efficiency into account, then I feel like you could calculate state point two, and then it says the intercooler takes the temperature back to ambient, 27 degrees, right? And then you know what to do with intercooler. And then so forth with the other state points. You know what a heat exchanger is. Um, you know, 700 joules per kilojoules per kilogram is added in the combustion chamber. The reheater brings the heat back up to 700 Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin. You know, whatever it is. So, um, <coughs> my my comment on this is fluency. Um, yeah, which in a two-hour exam is partially why I'm reluctant to make an open book. Um, oh, I should comment on that as well. You, you want to know this stuff and you want to be fluent, you want to be fast. So you want to know that if it's ideal gas, you want to know the formulas and you want to do them quickly. If it's a pure substance, you want to know how to read tables and interpolate very quickly and you want to get every interpolation correct. So you just want to, you know, you want to get every interpolation correct and fast. And you have to think about, okay, it's a 10 state point problem um, with a few questions at the back of it in about an hour, hour and 10 is what you want to be aiming for. <coughs>